We're talking psychedelics, plant medicines on the show today with one of the most prominent voices in the world of psychedelics. Our guest is Paul Austin. He's a friend of mine and he is also the founder of The Third Wave, which is so incredible. I'll link it up in the show notes. Um, The Third Wave has become, uh, in my opinion, like the ultimate resource on education of all plant medicines, psychedelics. They have tons of guides. They have a coaching certification for coaches, um, energy workers, healers, health coaches, anybody who wants to learn more about best practices in this world. I'll link that up as well. Um, And yeah, Paul has educated millions of people on the importance of safe and effective psychedelic experiences. Um, uh, He's considered a pioneer at the intersection of microdosing, personal transformation and professional success. He has been featured in Forbes, Rolling Stone, and the BBC's Work Life. Uh, He helps others use microdosing as a tool for professional development. Yep. And increase self-awareness by treating the use of psychedelics as a skill refined through mentorship and courageous exploration. Um, He has a new book out. It is, hold on, I'm going to read you the, like, because the little subtitles. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I had to pull it up. Mastering microdosing, how to use subperceptual psychedelics to heal trauma, improve performance, and transform your life. So awesome resource that is on Amazon. We'll link that up. And yeah, he's going to get all into it. We're going from anything from the health benefits of microdosing all the way to where we're at in the legal world. He's very involved in that whole community and has yeah done a lot of big work here. And so really grateful to Paul for that, for showing up to the plate in an area that is really, really um, sacred and special to me, a huge part of my own healing and transformation. So forever grateful to my little plants (laughs) and some of them that are a little more synthesized, but have a lot of benefits as well, which he will get into, including MDMA. Um, He's going to go from like history talking about that like the history of psychedelics to where we're at now and yeah i just really appreciate paul because he just brings a lot of professionalism to this whole arena so let's go ahead and get in and get educated here is paul austin okay so paul it's been cool like watching you just take microdosing by the horns take psychedelics by the horns like they were i feel like you know i don't know i don't know when exactly you can fill us in on like when you kind of really went full tilt with this but back in like 2017 ish there were like a lot of us it was like this very fringe like we're doing it we're into this no one's really talking about it but we're starting to talk about it and it was just kind of like mayhem you know it was like credible professional people health professionals therapists you know um all like this is cool stuff psychedelics and we're not buying into the bs anymore we're not going to sit here and like be shameful about it it dramatically changed my life but there were like not a lot of resources and obviously we have legality issues and all this stuff and then you like came in and you were like boom let's get this official let's create the third wave let's start speaking let's write books like let's create all of these amazing resources and like summits and like (laughs) you just really took it so i just i went with it you know well (laughs) because like so I started doing acid when I was 19 uh, <laughs> and I grew up and I think a lot of your listeners will resonate with this. I grew up in a, 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 a quite religious home. It wasn't, it wasn't like conservative and repressed, but it was definitely sheltered and like, mm-hmm. you know, morality was determined by the Bible and the law. And I remember, you know, when I was 16, I sat down uh, my parents had caught me smoking cannabis. It was, you know, the first time that I'd done any sort of drug. And I remember we sat down, my dad sat me down and it was a, it was a Sunday after church. And my dad looked at me and my dad's like a super sweet, kind, you know, guy, very loving, very present. And, you know, like many of us had been indoctrinated into the sort of propaganda of the war on drugs. And he looked at me right. after finding out that I'd smoked cannabis and said, you know, this is the most this is the most disappointed that I've been since my brother died in a car accident, which was like, I'm 16. I'm holding that. I was like, holy shit. So I stormed out of my house. You know, I'm like guilt, all the guilt and shame, you right, know, just sort of came right. to the forefront. And at the same time, I'm like, so, something feels off about this. Cause I just smoked a joint and it was like, I had the most fun of my life and I was laughing and it was beautiful and I connected with my friends. So, right. <laughs> and I, I was developed enough at that point in time and had enough respect with my parents where I was just like, look, I think you're wrong. You know, like, like, I don't think this is something that is bad and terrible. And then, 
you know, and I, so I continue to dabble a little bit. I, and by no means am I, um, recommending that young kids smoke cannabis. I think, you know, I did it a handful of times when I was, <laughs> when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, I think it can be very detrimental to uh, the development of brain health and to have that experience is really beautiful. So I stayed in that local community. And then at the age of 19, I did acid for the first time. And that's when sort of like, I realized how much guilt and shame I had internalized around who I was and what I believed. And (laughs) LSD gave me this sort of window of like, it was almost like, you know, LSD was, was the, the, it was like a priest in a way, or like a, like a blessing Mm -hmm. of you are loved, you are pure, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. And, and uh, the insights that came from that were then you know, I did it, I did it maybe 10 or 15 times over the span of a couple of years. And the message that kept coming through was life is special. Life is beautiful. Life is miraculous. Treat it in such a way. Uh, don't, don't, don't sacrifice. Don't, you know, don't play small, but like yep. live life to the fullest. And so that ended up, you know, fast forward. I'm in, I'm in Thailand in 2014, living in Chiang Mai, doing like the digital nomad thing. Mm-hmm. I had started my first business at that time, which was a teaching English platform. Mm-hmm. And I was listening to the Tim Ferriss podcast and heard about microdosing. And I remember back to my early LSD journeys. And I was like, you know, for like a week or two after what we now know as integration, it was like this beautiful afterglow where I was like meditating all the time and I was more connected and I was making right. really good food and lifestyle choices. And then it would sort of like, I would, I would keep a little bit of it, but a lot of it yeah. would just sort of dissipate. And so when yeah. I heard about microdosing, I was like, hmm, what if I could elongate that afterglow? So it's like, I can always sort of be in the flow of it. And so I started to microdose LSD twice a week. This was 2015, mm-hmm. uh, May, 2015. I did it twice a week for about seven months. And I significantly reduced my alcohol intake. I almost basically stopped drinking uh, and instead looked at microdosing to help with social anxiety. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to publish my first book on microdosing, which was just like an 80 page book that I published in 2016 Mm -hmm. on Amazon. And then I also started third wave at that time through this sort of energy. And because what I was really driven by is I love learning. I love education. I love teaching. Mm -hmm. And for me, what I identified as like the biggest gap in the landscape was like, it all comes back to education. How do we make right. informed choices and decisions? Right. How do we know what's what's good? And you know, what are some of the risks? There's always a balance. Right. And um, and then how can this help people? How can people benefit from this? Because when I thought about it, I was like, you know, my mom or my dad, they're not gonna like just go to Peru and drink ayahuasca like <laughs> as their first experience. Like a lot of people who are gonna be exposed to this in the next five, 10, 15 years better to start with microdosing. They can build a relationship with it. They can start low. They can sort of onboard themselves. They don't need to go into like the deep end of their consciousness right Right. away. And so that's why I focused on microdosing because my goal is like, my larger vision and goal is how do we make psychedelic medicine legal and accessible for everyone who wants to work with it? And how do we ensure that it's done in a safe, effective way? Mm -hmm. Um, And and really uh, both honoring like the ancient lineage and wisdom that we've been using these for thousands of years, Mm -hmm. but also recognizing that we're in 2023, we're in a modern context. We have to understand like, how does this work with our modern lifestyles and how can it help us improve on our modern lifestyles to live better, healthier, more nourished lives, more or less. So thank you for mentioning that at the beginning, because I think the, the biggest gift that I have to give in this sort of psychedelic space is structure. Yeah. You know, education yeah. in that structure totally. because psychedelics themselves can be so um chaotic totally. and they can be so they can shake up so much that having mm-hmm. that balance of the masculine structure I found uh really helps people to navigate what is often uncharted territory for them. Yeah. I mean, there's like kind of a double whammy I feel like where we're at in the world right now because yeah, using psychedelics especially like beyond those little sub perceptual doses you get a little higher than that it is, you've never, it's uncharted territory. It is chaos. It's like, whoa, my sense of reality that I thought was reality. It doesn't feel like reality now. And that's a pretty uncomfortable place to be. And on top of it, there's all this like Richard Nixon stuff still in everybody's heads of like, these are drugs and they're going to fry your brain and you're going to be messed up and you're going to be crazy and lunatic. And like, if you're in that space and you have no education and you have some of that programming, or you still have some of your like religious, like I'm doing something bad, I'm sinning right now. And like, that's your mindset 
that go coming into it. And then maybe you have a poor setting of like your friend thought it'd be really cool to go to a restaurant and, you know, walk around and you've never been in that. Go to Denny's on, on acid. Yeah, <laughs> exactly and like that that happens a lot like i hear those stories and i'm like oh my gosh no like and so yeah it's a recipe for paranoia it's a recipe (laughs) for anxiety it's a recipe for and then a lot of times people you know they try mushrooms randomly at a party or with a friend or they they try and then they have like what can be a very like harrowing experience and they're like okay, I never want to touch that again. Exactly. Like I never want to do that again. And I think that's so, that's such a, that's such a missed opportunity and, and such right. a sad thing because yeah. it's like, if this is done in the woods, if this is done in a contained setting, if you have a little bit of education, like you and I both know these can be the most profound and beautiful experiences yeah. of life. And yet um, that hasn't always been the case. And especially the last 40 years, because people are just like, they don't really know what to do with all the power right. that's coming through. Right. And you, you know, obviously you have the third wave, right? And I was reading in your book, you talked about the first wave, which is like ancient use of psychedelics. And then the the, the second wave is like the sixties. And I always say like, thanks. Or I don't know, you know, around that era, I'm like, thanks guys. Like, thanks for trying like, whoa. Um, some things went a little weird for sure, but you guys also kind of, you were the first. So thanks for the stuff you did do. And thanks for showing us some lessons on what not to do. And now the third wave is like now. And it's like, you know, um, I was at maps's psychedelic science summit in Austin in 2019. And like, and it was like, you know, you go to the psychedelic science summit. It's like, you know, the, a lot of the programmed world is like, Oh, like those are bad. Those are, it's like all therapists, neuroscientists, like doctors, doctors. uh, advanced health professionals, celebrities, (laughs) (laughs) you know, people like talking about how it saved their life and guys, Mm -hmm. you know, veterans. And Mm -hmm. it it was like the most, the most professional thing in the world. And the energy there was, how do we not mess this up again? Right. Like this changed my life so much. Like, how do we, how do we do this right this time? And that's Mm -hmm. really where you come in. And and I, I did want to say like, guys go to the third wave. Like you guys have in terms of structure. Yeah. Like you have so many guides, like seriously mad respect. I was going through all those. I'm like, wow, these are like super incredibly comprehensive. So there's all those. And then also kind of the the way we got connected is that uh, a shaman who was facilitating a retreat for me had done your, yeah, Mm -hmm. your microdosing certification coaching uh, course. And so um, I'll link that in the notes too. Like you guys, you really have shined on like education, responsibility, you know, uh, collecting all of the experts from all over the world. Like I've always been impressed with you guys on that. It'll go from like some Harvard educated scientist here to like some shaman that's been doing it for 30 years in the jungle, you know, like you get a lot of the diversity and the, the, the breadth of it. Right. And, right. And, and to, I, w- I want to speak to a couple of your points. Cause I think mm-hmm. they're, they're super, they're, they're well said. And I think super important, like what I've, I'm, I'm a, I'm a student of history, right? So what I studied in undergrad was history. Okay. Um, and even the frame, like with third wave, the third wave of psychedelics, it's, it's largely right. a historical frame, right? It's like right. the context and, and the whole idea. And, uh, you know, we, we know like ayahuasca and the Amazon and the indigenous use or Wachuma San Pedro with the ancient Incans or the Mazatec use psilocybin, the Aztecs use psilocybin. We also know, you know, there was Soma in ancient India, which was written about in the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. So there's this rich, rich lineage of plant medicine used for thousands and thousands of years. But I think what's most relevant to, to your audience uh, and to, an, you know, a Western audience is the fact that, you know, we we had these things, we, we had these Eleusinian mysteries in ancient Greece that Plato and Aristotle and Cicero and some of the most influential philosophers and thinkers and mathematicians and, and even politicians participated in, right? And they yeah. use this thing called kukion, which was a beverage that's made from ergot. And ergot is the same thing that LSD is made from. And so right. the, whole, the whole intention is like, what lessons and learnings are relevant from sort of the ancient indigenous use of these plant medicines around ritual, around the mystery, around even secrecy, right? Like a core element of the Eleusinian mysteries was if you told anyone about your experience, you would either be killed or banished from, Mm -hmm. from ancient Greece, right? So there was a real sort of like, keep the sacred, sacred, (laughs) right? Keep the mystery, the mystery. And then 
what was what was unfortunate is you know when Christi- so Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in like 307 AD Constantine made it the official religion and at, at that point he basically said no more pagan bullshit right he's like no more mysteries no more psychedelics right like the church is the truth the church is the answer everything has to go through it it was just as much political as it was religious um because rome was falling apart at that time and they had to figure out a way to sort of like keep a structure and so they utilized christianity to do that but that was 1700 years ago you know and so we as a western people we've been actually cut off from our psychedelic lineage for 1700 years. Yeah. I don't know how many generations that is, but like 60 generations, let's say. Um, And so when LSD came back on the scene in the, in the forties and fifties in the counterculture, we had no context for the ecstasy and the bliss and the transcendence and the awfulness and the despair like that it brought up. We had no ecstatic literacy or psychedelic literacy. And so Timothy Leary, Richard Alport come on the scene and they're just like, yeah, just take a bunch of acid. (laughs) <laughs> and see what happens, you know? And it's like, right. people were losing their minds. They're, they're and were these like, are Harvard psychiatrists, you know? <laughs> these are like well-to-do people right? who are like, and, and what, and like, look, I don't want to like over uh, negativize or whatever the sixties, no. because no, like there was a lot of beautiful, like lot of the computer revolution came from right. LSD and earth day came from LSD. And a lot of the Vietnam war movement uh, uh, against the Vietnam war came from LSD, Um, and like, there were a lot of acid casualties. There are a lot of people who lost their mind. There were a lot of risks and challenges. And what the government said at the time is they just said, fuck this, we're going to shut it all down. So, and what was unfortunate about that is, you know, there were over a thousand clinical papers published on LSD in the fifties and sixties, how LSD could treat alcoholism, anxiety, um, you know, depression, addiction, like it was well known. And then, and then all of a sudden prohibition comes around all of the research stops. Yep. And so when I started third wave in 2015, I knew that history. Cause I read like 20, like when I find, when I love a topic, I just go deep in it. Yeah. So I like read 20, 25 books about it. I'm like learning <laughs> all about the historical ends. And I'm, so I was thinking like, Precisely that. What can we do now in 20, 2015, now 2023? What can we do now to create the structure necessary yeah, so that nice. psychedelics don't tip sideways again? And, right. and that's why I focused on microdosing because I was like, I think the biggest issue in the 60s was that it was always about high doses right. of acid. And I think actually the way to culturally integrate these medicines is by letting people know that very low doses can also be very healing and helpful and that you don't need to lose your mind, so to say, to experience some of the benefits from these, these medicines. Okay. Yeah. Let's get into some of the benefits. Cause like you have your new book, mastering microdosing. I'm going to read the little subtitle for me, guys. It's how to use sub perceptual psychedelics to heal trauma, improve performance and transform your life. And so like, I mean, I was pretty rogue when I started microdosing LSD. Yeah, and, and, as we all were. Yeah, you know, it's just like you're like on message Cutting boards. Off and, little, yeah, little like, bits what do you do? I hope, yeah. I hope this isn't too much. You know, <laughs> right. Yeah. I guess we'll see what happens, kind of thing, uh, you know, and like making up my own protocols. What happens if I do it every day? What happens if I do it once a month? You know, like I was really experimenting with that and psilocybin too, but like, um, you've really taken the reins on like the health benefits, the health side of things, like sub perceptual. I didn't do a lot of sub perceptual <laughs> perceptual microdosing. It was always a little bit perceptual, but I know that like you guys often have people, you can't even feel it at first. Right. It, like you well, don't let's even, talk. That's yeah. a great actually opening topic. So the definition of microdosing appears to be uh, ever, ever changing and, and a little <laughs> okay. flexible. So when Jim Fadiman, he wrote a book called the psychedelic explorers guide, and he had a chapter mm-hmm. there in there on microdosing and he called it at that point, sub perceptual. Okay. But what, what, what we quickly found and what I quickly found and what a lot of people just like yourself quickly found is like, when we actually did it, it was helpful for it to be slightly perceptual actually. Yeah. I was helpful, you know, like even when I was doing microdosing acid the first time LSD, I was definitely feeling it a little bit, but, but the key is I was not intoxicated. Right. You know, I was, I was not, I was still aware of everything. I could still you know, navigate everyday reality. I could work on things. I could, I could talk uh, easily. I went to the gym. I would do CrossFit all the time on acid, you know, these microdoses of acid. And so when I was talking, I interviewed Paul Stamets, the renowned mycologist last year about this, because he's been very much a supporter of microdosing, really helped to blow it up through Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. And what he said really stuck with me, which is like microdosing is 
what I already mentioned, a sub intoxicating dose of a psychedelic. Okay. I like right. That. And I think that to me feels a lot more on the nose. There is yeah. still benefit and value from, let's say these sub perceptual doses, right? Like even if you can't feel anything and you're taking it consistently, the parallel that I would draw is to like taking fish oil or taking creatine or taking lion's mane. Like there are a lot of supplements that we can work with where we don't quote unquote feel it, but we know that it's healthy and beneficial. Uh-huh. And, and what I root in for that, I think your, your, your listeners will appreciate this is one of the, one of the, the biggest benefits to psychedelics that is not widely known is that they are anti-inflammatory. Um, and so psychedelics are, are largely serotonergic agonists, meaning they work in the serotonin system and 90% of our serotonin is actually in our gut. Uh, 90% of our serotonin receptors are in our gut. And of course we know through the vagus nerve, the gut brain access, we're learning more and more every day about how a healthy gut is actually what makes the biggest difference. And, and they've done, they've done research out of LSU that shows that the anti-inflammatory impacts of a substance called DOI, and the, the closest analog to that is San Pedro, Wachuma, mescaline, mm-hmm. um, that those anti-inflammatory impacts can have a significant um, impact on chronic inflammation. Interesting. And, and so, and so what we like, what your listeners definitely know is like, Chronic inflammation is sort of the underbelly of all modern disease, yes. right? right? And and so when we ad- when we address chronic inflammation, when we help to reduce chronic inflammation, it tends to have these sort of myriad benefits across the entire mm-hmm. system of the body. Mm-hmm. One of which is, of course, neuroplasticity, because as things are working in the gut, as as we're taking that microdose, and it's starting to heal some of that gut inflammation because of the gut brain access, it's also helping to heal inflammation in the brain. Cause when there's inflammation mm-hmm. in the gut, there's inflammation mm-hmm. in the brain. And so by healing that inflammation in the brain, it's allowing, it's opening up that window of neuroplasticity. Mm-hmm. And so what I often root in for folks, especially like health and wellness folks, people who are into physiology is like, we know a lot of us know sort of the ideal diet or the ideal lifestyle or the, or like movement and, and functional fitness and sleep. And many of us have a gap between where we actually are and where we want to be, right? And so what I find to be true with microdosing and even with higher doses of psychedelics is they simply help us. I think the core of it is like the sense of love, right? This unconditional love that comes through. They really help us to love ourselves in such a way where where we're like, we have to treat our physical body Mm -hmm. much better because everything lives in the body. The body keeps the score. And so when we're microdosing, we're reducing chronic inflammation, even when we're working with higher doses and we're getting that sort of aha moment of, okay, I do need to shift this. I do need to change this. I should be eliminating alcohol or you know, right. refined grains or other things like that. Right. Then, then microdosing is all of a sudden, it's this beautiful tool to, um, it's this beautiful catalyst to actually live how we know we're supposed to be living. And I think closing that gap between awareness and behavioral change Mm -hmm. is one of the biggest benefits of Mm. of working with uh, microdoses of psychedelics. Well said. I, you know, often like when you said it drops inflammation, I was like, instantly, I was like, oh yeah, it would have to, to help with the neuroplasticity. And I don't need to study to show me that it helps with neuroplasticity Mm. because I've experienced it so deeply. And it's like, I mean, I, I, you probably have actual data on this, but I can just tell, Mm -hmm. like if I do an actual journey, like (laughs) that little, little bit higher dose for me sometimes is like, Whoa, like all of a sudden my whole, it's like, I get it now. I get it. I get it. I get it. And then microdosing also is like, exactly like you said, it's like this little like bridge to help. I I don't microdose so much anymore, but I did for a long time. It, It was especially when I was like Unprogram, de- deprogramming, deprogramming all, all of the, bullshit, the like right? religious yeah. things and all that. It was really helpful for me in that time because it's so easy to go back into those programs when you're first starting. Right. So it was that beautiful bridge for me, but like, you know, sometimes people are like, how did you like, how did you change your mindsets and all this stuff so fast? And I'm like, do you really want to know? Cause I mean, I'll tell you is like psychedelics, like helped tremendously, you know, and some people don't want to hear that. And some people are interested, you know, and it's just like, that's just how it is. Like, That's if you just want the actual honest right. truth of like, yeah. yeah, I know they helped me tremendously. And I mean, to the point that even when I started, I was like, I found the cheat code to life. I don't want to tell anybody about it. 
And then I really, then the, then the plants were like, you're being, that's not cool. No, like in a loving way. Humility, like, oh, yeah, Humility right? that is yeah, not cool. Yeah. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. Well, it's we, just like- I'm, I'm glad you brought that up though. Cause we all go through <laughs> like anyone who's had a transformative experience in psychedelics or plant medicine, we go through this sort of evangelical phase of like, <laughs> yeah. I got to bring my mom to the Amazon to oh, do ayahuasca, gosh, you know, yes, please talk about it. You are right? so in this. Yeah. Like, so, and I haven't, I haven't done that. I mean, I, I, I ended up kind of back to the story that I told before um, a few years ago, Michael Pollan's book came out, which mm-hmm. you I obviously are familiar with. And some of your yeah. listeners may be uh, how to change your mind. New York times, number one, bestseller in 2018, the Netflix series came out mm-hmm. uh, last year as well, the yeah. four part docuseries. And uh-huh. when that book came out, I have a, I have a relationship with my dad in such a way where it's like, we're, we both love to read. So I'll send him a book to read and then he'll send me a book to read. And then I'll send him a book to read. And then like, we talk about it a little bit. Right. Awesome. So in, in 2018, 2019, I sent him Michael Pollan's book, how to change your mind. He read it. And then I was home in the summer of 2019. And I ended up guiding him through a high dose psilocybin experience. And this is someone who, you know, he went to seminary he mm-hmm. he's, he's been working at a Christian college for 40 years. He's okay. never been drunk in his life. He's never smoked weed in his life. Okay. Um, he's very straight laced. And he ended up having, you know, like a really beautiful experience where he was able to reflect on his relationship with his mom and his dad and his siblings nice. and like really go into a deep and profound space to to a point where he was just like, I took, you know, I because of course me doing this professionally, my parents initially were like, what the fuck is going on? You know, <laughs> right. like, but that helped to sort of contextualize the, nice. the beauty of this. Nice. Um, and so now they're like fully supportive and on board, nice. which is really, really, really mm-hmm. beautiful. And to me that speaks to like, like we, before we went live, we were talking about you living in Salt Lake and how a lot of ex-Mormons are now getting into plant medicine and psychedelics. And mm-hmm. obviously psychedelics have been used forever in like California and New York, it's, you know, there are these subcultural scenes, but what I've always cared most about is how do we bridge, as you said, how do we bridge the coasts? How do we bring it to places like Utah, to places like Mm -hmm. Michigan, to places like Texas, Mm -hmm. because a lot of folks who need it most are those who have, who have been raised in these more like conservative or repressive environments and plant Mm -hmm. medicines, you know, like Terrence McKenna has this famous quote, follow, follow plants, not gurus. Right. In other words, don't give your power up. Like so often in mainstream (laughs) religion, we give our power up to priests or bishops or ministers or, you know, but the truth is always God. The truth is always source. The truth is always this thing that is beyond. Uh, And psychedelics help us to remember that, you know, because we, we often, we, we, as a culture, we live in amnesia. You know, we, we have this, this sort of widespread amnesia about what it means to really be human and psychedelics help us to remember the divinity of our existence, which is, I think is incredibly profound and beautiful. Yeah. I was just thinking if, if somebody, you know, found my podcast, maybe they saw a recipe they liked on my Instagram or (laughs) a a workout and they found my podcast and they might be like, fall, like you're listening to plant, you're talking to plants, like what is happening right now. But I, I was just like laughing at how that would sound. But once you've experienced it, it's like, it's a different story. You know, it's kind of like the example you gave of your dad. It's like, yeah, like at first it's like, you, there's all this programming. It's bad, 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 bad. We have no context for it. It's like what you can learn through a plant. Like, what are you talking about? You know? And so, but then once you experience it, then it's a different story. You're like, I see, I see now, you know? And that's like, I guess anybody listening, if you're still listening, cause you're just really intrigued and you've never experienced any of these things. And you're like, well, this is fascinating. You know, I mean, I'll just share from my experience, like it's easy it's easy to judge something that you don't understand. And so I'll just leave it at that. It's just like, you know, it's like, um, to each their own. And, and I, I mean, I guess I shouldn't probably well, education like, is key. And I think, yeah. I think within this, even it's like what a lot of folks don't know is Oregon legalized psilocybin. So yeah. you can now go to Oregon and work legally with psilocybin Colorado yeah. has legalized personal possession of all plant medicine. But I think even most importantly, there's a nonprofit called maps. Mm-hmm. that has already finished phase three trials yeah. and they expect by next year, MDMA uh, will be available to treat PTSD. And what's incredible about this. And I think this is, this is where it's like, even if some of the listeners are like, eh, this is not so much my thing, or I don't necessarily want to work with psychedelics, which yeah. 
totally oh. okay and cool yeah. and no problem <laughs> at all. But the the clinical results of uh, psychedelics for things like PTSD, depression, mm -hmm. addiction, mm -hmm. alcoholism are profound and incredible. So just as like a brief example of that, yeah. typical treatments, typical treatments for PTSD uh, are about effective 20% of the time. Uh, and those typical treatments tend to be, uh, you know, mostly SSRIs, antipsychotics, and benzodiazepines. Mm -hmm. Cannabis, as it's become medicalized, has been more and more helpful. Mm -hmm. um, what they found when they've done phase three clinical trials with MDMA for PTSD, which is usually like, you know, you're having about 250 people who go through a process where they're doing a 12 week uh, experience mm -hmm. uh, and they take MDMA three times in those 12 weeks. And then they have therapeutic support before, during, and after those MDMA mm -hmm. experiences. So it's called MDMA assisted psychotherapy mm -hmm. and, and those results. So normally 20%, 70% of people who mm -hmm. go through this heal their PTSD. And on average, they've had PTSD for 17 years. Mm, I didn't know that 17 years part. Yeah. That, like on average, 17 years. And, and they even see this epigenetically that their telomere length is, is significantly reduced as a result of the PTSD. Mm. And after the MDMA assisted psychotherapy, their telomere length actually increases, insane. meaning they're adding years yeah. to their life as a result of going right. through this treatment. So it's like, when we talk about these, and, and it's a similar efficacy for psilocybin for major depressive disorder and treatment resistant depression, mm -hmm. it tends to be about three times as effective as, as normal, um, like psychiatric medication interventions. Mm -hmm. And it is powerful. You know, it is catalytic. It is sometimes volcanic. This, this is not something to, this is not, you should not do this sort of, um, offhandedly or right. like randomly. It does need intention. It needs reverence. It needs respect, respect. And I think Education. that's the other element of it. Education. Yeah. It's like this, you know, it's, it's not easy to do deep healing work. You know, right. so often right. we've been conditioned just to, to numb. Right. right to mm -hmm. to just numb the symptoms and make it go away mm -hmm. and what psychedelics do is they go no like there's a story there's an emotion there's a trauma that is deep inside your psyche that is deep inside your body and you what you need to do to heal that is you need to confront it mm -hmm. and there has to be a catharsis there yep. has to be a release yep. of it and actually by releasing that that that's how we can heal it because it's no longer exactly. this thing that's stuck in our subconscious or unconscious exactly. we actually bring a light to it and then boom, it, it, we can actually love it. We can forgive it. We can heal it. And we can actually welcome it back in as a more integrated self. So funny. Right before uh, this interview, I was interviewing this couple that they are, they built their whole business on heart intelligence. She was like a cardiologist. And they went through all oh, this beautiful. healing and they talk about emotion. So we just, I just had this conversation, but it's like, I was reading a study about psilocybin and it was like saying how, you know, it was comparing psilocybin to SSRIs for depression. Right. And like SSRIs, like that artificial boosts and it, it super boosts in serotonin, right? Like it's just like chronically, it makes it so that th the people that did it said that they felt like less, they felt less pain. Right. Mm -hmm. And then their experience sure. of doing like the mushroom journeys was no, I felt all the pain. I felt it all, but with much better results. And it's like, just like we were talking about, even on a daily basis, if right now I got super mad at my kid or something, and then I was like, Oh, my kid, blah, blah, blah. And I just like never process that. I never took the moment to be like, I feel really frustrated right now. I feel fear. Mm -hmm. I feel anger. What do I feel? Like, just let it run its course. If I'll just sit with that and feel it like you, you kind of don't really need to do much beyond that is just feel it. And so like these, these tools, like you, you know, if you look at the Johns Hopkins stuff and that, that there's videos you can watch, there's some of the stuff from MDMA, from some of these, um, treatment Medical resistant trials. veterans you're talking about, yeah. and they, you can actually see little clips of their journey and like props to them for sharing that. But it's like, they're actually saying like, yeah, like the guy next to me died and it was my fault. Right. And he's mm. crying. And it's like, that mm. stuff is like that thing that they never wanted to face. Like they were able to face it in this really safe internal environment because of how they interact in the body and now they can release it. Right. And so that's, what's so beautiful is like, we all have PTSD to a certain level, you know, we all we have, all have like trauma. Programs. We all have challenges we've gone through. Right? right. Yeah. We all have these programs and all these things. And they're just like these really amazing, beautiful tools to help us like come into the place that not only 
unraveling that, but it's like, okay, Plato and Aristotle and like who <laughs> it's just like, yeah, it's kind of cool. And so many others. I mean, the, the you know, <laughs> Aldous Huxley and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, right. you know, like all these really prominent creative visionary intellectual, right. even in modern life have, have worked with these. And, and to me, like that is what I'm inspired and motivated by the, the healing potential of these cannot be, cannot be understated, right. For PTSD, Mm -hmm. for depression, for addiction, for alcoholism, for OCD, for end of life anxiety, they really are incredible interventions for people who are struggling with, with deep issues. And yet they're also, as you and I have also experienced, they're incredible for creativity, for vision, for communication, for relationships. And that is what I'm most inspired by. You mentioned the, the training program that that we've we've created. Um, you know, I started it a couple of years ago. And what I noticed at that point in time is all of the training programs that were out there were really for the therapeutic use of psychedelics. Right. You know, they were really speaking to clinical therapists, to social right. workers, Everything. to psychiatrists, <laughs> to medical doctors. Mm-hmm. And that's necessary and important because we need mm-hmm. a lot of those folks to be trained in this modality in order to help right. those who need to heal, heal. And I noticed that there were a lot of health and wellness coaches, a lot of fitness coaches, a lot of executive coaches, a lot of uh, life and relationship coaches mm-hmm. that also were becoming interested in, in psychedelics. And there right. wasn't there wasn't a training program for them, you right. know? And so the way that I've contextualized um, the the sort of skill of psychedelics, that's what I often refer to it as. It's like mm-hmm. our capacity first, first our capacity to do our own inner work, to do our own healing, to do, mm-hmm. to do our own transformation. The depth that we cultivate through these medicines allows us to actually show up for our coaching clients in a way that has more grace, more patience, more presence, we can right. hold more complexity. Right. And with coaching, the key is we don't need to fix the past. We need to, we need to heal the past. We need to release the past. We need, we need, we, need, yeah. we often need to have a catharsis and we're creating, right? We, we, right. as humans, we are fundamentally creators, mm-hmm. whether we acknowledge it or not. And, and, and owning that, right. Owning the fact that we are creators actually is, is what allows us to create because so often we project, right? We blame, we say all these external circumstances are why I can't do X, Y, and Z. We, when we take back all of those projections and we realize that we are fully 100% responsible for creating our own life, which is often what psychedelics will teach, all of a sudden a vista of opportunities opens up in front of us. And so what we're training our coaches on is like, you know, how can these medicines be used, whether it's MDMA, whether it's ketamine, whether it's ayahuasca, whether it's psilocybin, whether it's a microdose or a mystical dose, whether, you know, where do meditation and breath work and yoga, these non-psychedelic modalities fit in as well, diet, exercise, sleep. And how can you as a coach leverage and integrate psychedelics as a core tool in your toolkit? Because we, we as coaches, we have, you know, there are many different tools. We might use uh, meditation as a tool. We might right. use blood work as a tool. We may use an aura ring as a tool. Um, What about psychedelics as a tool? Um, And like we were talking about earlier, because of their impact on neuroplasticity, right? The core objective of hiring a coach is to transform. It's to change. It's to grow. So whenever I think about this overlap of psychedelics and coaching, I'm like, to be honest, any coach that doesn't work with psychedelics is at a disadvantage, Yeah, you know, because like, it's sort of like the parallel that I've been drawing lately is like artificial intelligence, right? Like artificial intelligence, it's here, it's coming. When you learn how to have a relationship with it, when you, when you can learn how to work with it, well, it can dramatically um, minimize the amount of time and energy you have to spend on certain tasks that you'd rather not do. It's the same with psychedelics. When you can learn to have a relationship with psychedelics, when you can learn to work with them intentionally, when you can, Mm -hmm. when you have enough context and knowledge to be able to, Mm -hmm. you know, assess a client, prepare a client, help a client integrate, Mm -hmm. you are working with a tool that is incredibly powerful and that will be an incredible ally Mm -hmm. in your coaching practice. And I Mm -hmm. think that, um, with that being said, they are powerful. They are catalytic. These are not just sort of play tools. It's not like, you know, you mm-hmm. don't want to become Mickey and Fantasia where you get the mop and all of a sudden things sort of spiral out of control. It's mm-hmm. important to, to have the reverence, to have the education, to have the training. So what we do as part of our training program is a lot of the training programs out there are just like, 
you know, you're online, you get some lectures, you have some discussions, you do some classes. Mm-hmm. Um, what we do and it, it, what is centrally important is we have a six day experience in Costa Rica. So all of our coaches then fly down to Costa Rica. We do a microdose for, for like a hike. And then we do a high dose ceremony as mm-hmm. part of that, because that, that experience with psychedelics, uh, it, what it does is it creates integrity in the practice, mm-hmm. you know, like, and so what we always tell our coaches in our program is you have to walk the path Definitely. before you walk others through that path. Right. Um, and with experience with psychedelics, it's always experiential. It can never just be no. sort of cognitive <laughs> or in the mind, you know? It's like, I've never worked out before and I'm like, okay, so here's what you're going to do. I read this one time. It's like a exactly. squat and you put this bar on your back and you just go up and down. That's it. <laughs> It'd be That's like it. that. <laughs> or jujitsu, you know, a jujitsu teacher who's like, yeah, I've read, I've read like 30 books on jujitsu and I listened to these podcasts about it. So I'm going to teach you now how to do jujitsu, right? It's not embodied. And, right. I, and with any, with any skill, with any practice, it, you know, they often say that the biggest gap is from the head to the heart, mm-hmm. you know? And so closing that gap is what psychedelics often allow for us. So we can actually live the values that we, we believe are most fundamental and important to our, to our, to our health and well-being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'll link the, the course that he's talking about, um, in the show notes, and I'll also link both of your books, um, but your new one, Mastering Microdosing and just link, let you guys link know. Link the Mastering Microdosing one. Cause that, that really is okay. like, okay. it's we'll the third that. edition of okay. the Microdosing book. I just changed the name of it. So. Okay, cool. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but you have everything from like setting intentions to sourcing psychedelics. I'm always like, just go yeah. find the guy with dreads at the reggae concert. That, just kidding. There you go. I'm there just kidding. Go. I'm kidding guys. <sighs> Don't do that. I'm just sorry. I shouldn't have said that on my podcast. <laughs> well, what we do, this this will actually be very helpful for your audience. What we do through Third Wave is, um, and and not everyone will be ready to do this, but we we sell a grow kit for mushrooms. Nice. So you know, because a lot of times, I think I think mushrooms are the medicine of the people, right? The mm-hmm. the mycelial network of mushrooms, like ayahuasca, is very particular. Five MEO is very particular, <laughs> um, but mushrooms grow everywhere. Um, there are, there are oldest ancestor as, as a human species and they're accessible and they're easy to grow. So we, we, what we make available on third ways website is, you know, for a couple hundred bucks, we'll just, we'll send you a kit that will, that'll come to your home. Uh, you have to buy the spores separately because we can't right. legally, <laughs> legally include the spores of that, uh, but you can buy a kit, send to your home. And then we have like a little mini course with videos on how to use the kit to grow your own mushrooms. It takes four to six weeks. And then after four to six weeks, people often have enough mushrooms for the next year or two yeah. years, depending on how yeah. much they use. And then you can take those mushrooms and you can make microdoses and do ceremonies. And what we also emphasize and what we have on, on third waves platform is, you know, we talked about the education but we also have now a directory of providers, which I think would also be very good to, to link to mm-hmm. where it's like, Hey, if you're like, if you've listened to this podcast or maybe you've read a story somewhere, or, you know, like this is showing up more and more in your field and you're like, maybe right. I do want to like yeah. try this out. What we have in our directory is we have trusted clinics, trusted nice. and legal retreat centers that you can go to. We have therapists that you can work with. We have nice. coaches that you can work with because embarking on, on, on a psychedelic journey, right? it's not an individual process. It really is a community thing. And it's critical to have support. Totally. Totally. I mean, it's one of the most common questions I get on social media because people hear little things like they're like, well, how do I get started? I'm like third wave, third wave, third wave. Cause like, thank you for doing that. Cause I don't want to sit there and like be, I'm, that's not my main gig is being like a psychedelic coach. You know what I mean? And so it's like, so nice to have that resource. So we'll definitely link that up. Um, and yeah, just everything, anything else, any like words of wisdom or anything cool happening in the psychedelic world that I might not be aware of, or just final thoughts, final thoughts. I think we talked a little bit about the, the legalization that's happening in Oregon and Colorado. Mm -hmm. We talked about FDA approval. Mm -hmm. Um, we also, we also went through, you know, okay. A couple, couple more things that I'll, that I'll contribute to this conversation that I think be helpful. One is, one is we started a nonprofit, uh, to legalize microdosing. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the ways in which uh, psychedelics are being weaved in is it is 
you know, you have to essentially be paired with a facilitator or a guide. You have to go to a center. This is how it's happening in Oregon. Once you have a facilitator, you can then, you know, take the mushroom um, and then have that experience. But as you and I both know, when we microdose, we're, it, it's like a supplement we take at home and we navigate our everyday life. And so a lot <laughs> right. of the, a lot of the legislation out there currently does not reflect the reality of how most people are working with, with right. psychedelics, which is through microdosing. So we started a nonprofit called the Microdosing Collective. And the focus of the, the Microdosing yep. Collective is to de- help develop legal policy so that at some point in the near future, it might take three years, it might take five years, it might take seven years. But at some point in the near future, you'll be able to, you know, somehow, I don't know if it'll be mail order, I don't know if it'll be going into CVS, I don't know if it'll be, you know, like a dispensary model, but you'll be able yeah. to access uh, microdosing supplements that you can work with uh, oh, yeah. at home uh, oh, yeah. as part of that. So that that's a really fun initiative and a project. And if there anyone, is there anyone who's listening who like wants to get involved, the website for that is microdosingcollective.org. And we will, you know, you, you mentioned the MAPS conference that you went to in 2019. There's, a, there's another MAPS conference coming up in June of this year in Denver. Yeah. And yeah. we'll be hosting a couple events through the nonprofit, oh, really? the nonprofit for that as well, like a like a sound healing and then a and then a, cool. and then a small party. And then I think the only other thing that I would mention is if folks do want to dive deeper into this, we talked about the platform and the website. You know, I mentioned the directory. Mm-hmm. I mentioned um, you know all of our education. We also have a podcast. So uh, and uh, we're going to flip the script <laughs> and have have you on as well. But we've interviewed you know, some, some of the luminaries, uh, in the psychedelic yeah. space, we've interviewed folks yeah. like, uh, Mark Manson, Stephen Kotler, um, right. uh, Ben Greenfield, um, you know, a lot of folks who are sort of tangentially interested in psychedelics. So if yeah. there are any folks who are listening to this, who just want a deeper dive that that's called the psychedelic podcast. So it's pretty easy and straightforward. Awesome. And we've done about a couple hundred episodes and that would also be something to, to check out. Awesome. I'm honored to be on that list. And I might have some intros, but you've probably already had them on, but I'll, I'll double check when we're that. done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, All right, Paul, thank you so much. Again, we'll link everything up. Um, the website, just to go on the show notes, but it's the third wave, the third wave.co. Co. Co. Right. Yeah, and I'll, I'll CO. direct link to those resources that he mentioned, Cody coaching certification training program and all that. And that's so cool that you guys do the in-person experience, much respect. Yeah. Cause that's like, it's gotta happen. So it's a, and it's a lift, right? It's, it, it it's more complicated, but it, I think for the integrity of what we're doing, exactly. it's so essential to, to the training. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I respect that. And the initiative yeah. you guys got going, I'm like, yes, thank you for showing up to the plate. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much. Thank Paul. you. Thank you so much. 